Good day, I'm Dr. T and welcome to my desktop. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about syllabuses and other kind of start of the class, more administrative paperwork. Stuff you're gonna have to do, but it's not really part of teaching. Okay, so I'm gonna start out with the syllabus. This is kind of a, a dummy syllabus, one that uh, is based off of the ones I use, but obviously I've just made up, uh, you know, class information, etc. And so for this one, with the syllabus in general, they serve kind of three roles. The first role is, hey students, here's the important information that you're going to need to know uh, because this is how the class is set up. Uh, this is the stuff the student probably should have read, but they may or may not. Um, you know, everybody's different. The second part is, if disputes occur, this is very much like the EULA of the class. <laughs> Here are the guidelines for the class. If you don't like it, take a different class. Uh, and if you wish to have a dispute, these are the guidelines that you're disputing within. Obviously, your syllabus will not overrule uh, university guidelines. And then third is if a student decides to transfer and the incoming school is evaluating whether or not or how to give the student credit for a class, they'll quite often look at the syllabus to see what does it match most closely within their curriculum and is it sufficiently matching whatever's in their curriculum in order to give credit for that. Okay, so let's start off and I'm basically going to kind of address those three things uh, in roughly that order uh, because, you know, the first and most important, every student should read it for the core information. And so we're going to start out with, obviously, I, you know, I put the title of the class on there, the semester, and that's it's just good practice. Um, <laughs> if only so you know which syllabus is which. Now, typically these are going to be submitted to your department chair or to the department uh, administrative assistants and whatnot. Uh, so it's not like, you know, you have to prove that which one goes to which class. You just kind of, you know, these are what they are. Okay, then we're going to start with some, just some general contact information. Now, in the past, um, that third line, the video chat, I wouldn't have included, but post-2020, video chat has gone from occasional to pretty much the norm. So I would have the link to whatever video chat system you're using for your personal room. Uh, depends on what you're using would be, depending on how that link works and whether or not it would be relevant to have that. If you have TAs or SIs, I actually have SIs, not TAs, but TA is kind of a more generic one. Uh, and if those are ones where the students will be contacting them directly, it might be good to have their information here. Now, you'll notice here that I have, uh, I don't have sections on this one. For starters, this is one syllabus for all my sections. Uh, and second, instead of identifying, you know, section 01 and 02 or 03 and 07 or whatever sections you're teaching, I identify those by uh, time. A lot of students won't know what section they're in. Uh, they're aware that there are different sections, but they don't actually look at that part of the section. Quite often, students will really only look at the prefix part of the course number and not any further. So, hey, I'm in your chemistry class. Okay, great. Which one? I teach four completely different chemistry classes a semester. Um, or that kind of scenario, which is really awkward. So if you're a student watching, <laughs> Make sure you catch the number. Um, but they will definitely know what time they're starting. So 01, 02, that will confuse most students. Whereas uh, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, or whatever kind of distinguishing feature does tend to be a little bit more clear uh, for most students uh, who are watching this and usually doesn't have any issues as they're reading through it. Okay, uh, next up I'm going to have office hours. Office hours, um, these are of course, you know, times when you're in your office and students can kind of wander by. Now I personally have open door policies, so if I'm there, the students can wander by. It doesn't really matter. Um, obviously 2020 was a dumpster fire, so that wasn't really a thing. It was kind of all virtual. Ugh, let's hope not to go back to that again. Uh, most schools will require around five-ish or so office hours. Sometimes it's just a, everybody has to have five. Sometimes it's X number of office hours for every class hour you're teaching or some kind of weird calculation. It, does, it usually rounds to around five to six, depending on what you're doing. And so it's like, okay, my office hours will be 11 to noon, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, three to four. And then, you know, I put in a little bit of information, like if you, know, if you want to meet other times by appointment. It's always great. Other times by appointment, great thing to just stick on there. Uh, let the students know and kind of make it, you know, official. Hey, if, you, if this doesn't time doesn't work for you, just email me. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work something out, you know. Uh, I find a lot of students that during office hours, there's a small fraction of students who like feel they have to set up an appointment during office hours. So I point out that if it's during office hours, they don't need an appointment. Um, now, obviously, things like open door policies and that kind of stuff, how, you know, you're available only during office hours or you're available 
broadly. That's much more of a your schedule, you kind of thing. So that varies heavily depending on what on earth is going on for you. And I like to keep that open with the students, you know, let them know. Okay, uh, the next part, this one usually students do read, uh, although they don't always believe it, uh, is the materials. So what you want to do is have all the materials that you need for the class. Uh, be relatively specific. You don't want to leave anything major off of this list. This is what the students are ideally going to go buy, etc. Um, and gives them an idea of kind of the general cost for the class. Uh, at least they can go shopping. So like in this class, it's going to be using an audience response system. Uh, I'm just going to clicker. Obviously, you would have like the make and model of clicker that they need to get uh, if you're using that. A pro tip, if you're not going to go for a clicker um, or you want to go for a lower cost option, as long as you don't mind not getting the who's done what feedback, but you can just kind of look out. Uh, eight and a half by 11 dry erase boards, kind of like the ones the students will put on the dorm doors. Uh, those work great. Now, you'll want to buy those. You don't want to get the students to buy them because the students will just not bring them to class. It, I've tried that, it doesn't work. So a classroom set of dry erase boards works great as kind of an alternative to using a clicker. Uh, a lot cheaper, actually a lot more versatile. The only difference is that if you're going to try and grade based off, you actually have to look right down who did what, and that becomes, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to try that. Um, but it is an option if you're going to use a kind of more traditional clicker system. Okay, then you've got, you know, okay, books you need. The, the lab manual. Um, I always stick course management system reference materials. Uh, that's just reminding me to tell them to check the course management system. D2L, Blackboard, whatever you're using. I'm teaching chemistry, so, you know, scientific calculator is probably a good thing to have. Once again, you don't want to leave out any major things. You know, that's only maybe 20 bucks uh, if they get in a fancy one, but, you know. And I don't specify brand usually. I love the Texas Instrument. Uh, what is it? The 30, uh, 32 uh, II, the second version. I think that's, I think that's my favorite. Uh, I'll have to go look. You know, there'll be something edited in. Uh, anyways, and then, but you know, once again, calculator's calculator. Um, and then whatever book you're using. Now, I actually try and do open source whenever possible. Some classes I can do it for, others I can't. I teach a, a physical science for teaching majors that there's like two books, they're both lousy, they're both way overpriced, and there's no open source book. And it's like, um, But most of my chemistry classes, the lower level ones, you've got some decent open source books. Like the first edition of uh, OpenStax was garbage. It wasn't garbage, it was bad for uh, Gen Chem 2. Gen Chem 1, it was okay. The second edition of OpenStax is actually like legit. Uh, I mean, it's not amazing, but it's like, it's good enough. Uh, so that's usually what will probably go there. Um, just trying to save them a couple bucks, but you know, whatever you're using, stick that there. Now, I'm not going to be using uh, the questions in the back of the book. Um, that's why I'm using the online homework system. So if you're using an online homework system, you know, you want to put that in there. If it's not bundled with the book, obviously if it's bundled with the book, you want to point out that you need it still, but bundle it with the book. Um, and because of that, it really doesn't matter what book they have for me. So once again, I'm, I try and use free when possible. And I just specify that, hey, for this book, you don't, the student doesn't need that book. So try and be open um, how much you're going to need that book. Now, you notice that Double Dagger doesn't exist in the lab manual. That lab manual, we're working out of, it's actually a workbook. And in that case, they have to have that exact copy, you know, that year, et cetera. Some years they might get by with the one from the year before, although I don't usually tell them that. Um, and then this is a lab course, so part of what they need is particular lab attire, good old PPE. Um, and then, of course, I've got a statement about COVID-19 because this fall 2020. Hopefully that I've deleted it for this semester's classes. I hope I can keep it deleted. So it's basically all the stuff they need to buy. You're kind of setting up the what you're going to need for supply lists. And, you know, I didn't put anything like a notebook, that kind of stuff. That's kind of assumed. Um, because hopefully, you know, they're going to take notes somehow, hopefully. Uh, okay, the next part, and this is kind of actually almost to the point where the students stop reading. And this is, to be honest, everything else here is not as essential for the students to start, you know, continue reading. Um, Grading procedures, what's the grade makeup? You can do a point-wise system, that's particularly popular, a lot of students like that. I do um, weighted average. Weighted averages are nice because they'll give me more flexibility if things get funky during the year. So let's say I have to get rid of a test, or if I want to drop a test, um, a weighted average works a lot better if I'm going to drop grades, do anything like that. Uh, especially if you, if you hit the football team that goes out and 
they miss a, you know, a lab or two. This easily drops it from the lab section. Most of your learning management systems, this will just be a check mark. So I really like weighted average. Students um, vary. Uh, a lot of them do like point systems. Uh, they are slightly easier to calculate, although weighted averages are not that hard. But for some reason, a lot of students don't know how to calculate a weighted average. Um, that said, a lot of learning management systems will do that for you. Now, as I mentioned, drop tests. So what I have found is dropping, especially exams, but a lot of things, giving things a dropped grade is a really great way to cut the drama. So I'll say, okay, we'll have four tests, uh, four kind of unit tests, and then a final. And so what I'll do is I'll take the top three. And that way, student like, oh no, bad thing happened. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That'll be your drop test. No drama. Uh, and then, you know, you want to make sure you express to students that this is not trying to boost your grade. This is not trying to drop the lowest test. This is trying to drop the test that something bad happened with. Uh, so it, you know, it will drop the lowest test, but the idea is it's really more of like a missed test kind of thing. Set expectations. You always want to <laughs> manage expectations. It's definitely critical. And so I find this really cuts down on drama if you do that for a lot of things. Typically, the lab would also have that. Um, in this case, I didn't, but it varies. Do you want them to make up labs they missed, or do you want to just drop one? Uh, depends on what your lab schedule is. Once again, 2020 was a little bit weird. I usually have that asterisk on the lab as well. Uh, now, because this is a lab class, because this is a combined, so this particular setup, I'm, in my school, the K at the end indicates the lecture lab course combined. And so basically, uh, the next sentence is kind of this, okay, so this is a lecture and a lab course. If you don't do the labs, you're going to fail no matter what. And so this is getting into more of the dispute category. Uh, so at this point, what I'm setting up is this idea that, okay, if you come back at me, here's the options I've got. This is kind of the EULA category now. It's so like, okay, this is fine. Labs only worth 15%. In theory, if you didn't do any of the labs whatsoever and got perfect on everything else, you get an 85%, but I'm not going to let that slide. That's not okay with me. So I'm going to give you either an incomplete or a failing grade on that, depending on what's going on. So I'm setting this aside. This way, and I've had to implement it once. It almost became twice, but uh, <laughs> they, they looked out. <laughs> uh, I've had to implement this once, though, uh, so that you are set. So that you can say, no, this was in the syllabus. You didn't turn in your lab work. You failed. Uh, and then just come over information. Now, this one's set up for both a face-to-face -face and an online component. 2020 really showed us that you want that versatility. So I'm setting this up is that face-to-face -face labs, that's, that's, that's fine. If you're doing outside of face-to-face -face, where I'm not watching you kind of thing, I want to photographic documentation. Just prove me you actually did it and you're not just lying kind of thing. Uh, Useful if you're doing DIY at-home labs. I don't like them. I use them for online courses, but I don't like them. And you'll notice something actually fairly similar on this one. Uh, if you look at all my syllabuses, they're all very, very similar. I start out with kind of a template. That way I don't get confused as to what's in my syllabuses, and I have kind of like the, the bases covered. So a lot of these, especially at this point, a lot of them are going to duplicate very widely. Uh, basically, I'm telling hey, do your homework for, you know, beforehand. Uh, don't wait till the end kind of stuff. And this is kind of more grading procedures. So let's talk about group work. If we do group work, then uh, what I'm pointing out is like, hey, everyone gets the same grade. Uh, but I am reserving the right to not continue that if there's problems. And this is giving myself some options. This is well into the EULA territory of the syllabus where I'm giving myself options to uh, deal with situations that come in the future. Um, and then, you know, what an A, B, C, D, and F are. Once again, I'm giving myself options. I'm trying to restrict it so it's like they can't come back two years later and say, hey, you misentered this grade. I'm like, okay, you need to get it in early. Now, this is an area where grade correction, et cetera, uh, is going to be heavily influenced by university procedures. So this is probably almost not useful to me, but this is kind of a stab in the dark kind of part. Education statement, um, these are just kind of a formality here. Notice how very vague, this is a mission statement, it's very vague here. Really what this is going into is this last line. Actually, there's kind of two things. 
Um, first, I'm kind of setting up some expectations, alerting them that I'm going to be using some non-traditional teaching styles. Once again, if the student comes back and says, he didn't teach, he just made us do worksheets. Well, no, I'm using a flip style. And I wasn't just making you do worksheets, you know. Uh, but actually, the last part of this one, see schedule for lists of topics and planned days. Uh, when it comes to that third one for what a... Um, another school might be looking at, what I'm cluing them in is that, oh, look at the next file. Because I keep that as a second file. I don't keep them as the same file. So look at that other file. And if I was sending this off to another school for them to review for credit, et cetera, I'd have to make sure I sent both files. Um, I was told to put it in there, therefore it went in there. That, that's it. And you'll have a lot of those things. Um, actually, a lot of those can be dealt with by links, and you'll see it at the very end. Okay, late work policy. Um, you want to have one of these. What happens when the student does not get their work in on time? Give yourself some options. Obviously, you're going to kind of be required to accommodate students if weird things happen, especially during COVID. That was a, you know, most schools had, you know, orders from on high, be very lenient kind of things uh, because of COVID. Uh, don't know what years are going to continue like. Uh, but you want to give yourself some options, give your ability to be lenient in some cases, but also, you know, have a, you know, dude, it's been a month. It's too late. Uh, so kind of lay out some basic guidelines, and you do need to follow these. <laughs> At least try. Obviously, COVID was nuts, but, you know, once you're outside of that COVID weird scenario, you do need to kind of follow your policy. Uh, okay, well, I call this techn technology default policy. That's a terrible name for this section. Basically, this is me laying the basic groundwork for what is and is not allowed in my class. Uh, and this is what, if academic misconduct occurs, is how I'm going to be basing my academic misconduct. Uh, now, I'm fairly lenient. Um, so lecture, basically, as long as they're not making a mess, I'm fine with that. Um, and so I'm basically kind of, you know, laying out some breaks. I discovered... I was required to, in some schools, to put this kind of policy in here. Um, but, yeah. It's not... Uh, you want to have some break and some guidelines, what they can do with breaks, etc. Um, In-class tests and quizzes, okay, you know, this is what it... These are the guidelines for a test. Even if I don't say it, I've already said it. I've had students that literally asked the TA, this was like my first or second year teaching, literally asked the TA how to Google one of the questions on the test. Okay, I want to make sure it's clear, you're not allowed to Google the test question during the test. <laughs> you know. Uh, so here's for in-class tests and quizzes, here's for take-home tests and quizzes. Notice, I know good and well they're going to Google it, so it's just like they're allowed to Google it, they just can't find a friend, that kind of stuff. Let's just be honest, unless you're going to be rather draconian Good luck getting them to not do that. Group work, you know, just kind of setting up things. And then the state I'm currently in is a two-party state where both parties need to know that's being recorded. So in case I decide to record the class, I'm letting them know I might very well record the class. Uh, and I've also given them permission to record the class up in the lab part. I just said, don't publish it. Okay, academic dishonesty. This one kind of has to be in here. Um... What's the consequences if you break the aforementioned policies or those for the particular assignment? And the short answer is I throw the book at you. Um, accommodation statement. Once again, this usually has to be in there. Your disability student services will have policies for that. The students will get a letter, and you basically have to do these. Um, and so I'm like, yes, I will accommodate required accommodation. And then I also point out that if it's... Um, A factor requiring a student needs accommodation for, it's not going to advantage them, though, over other students. I, I don't need a letter requiring that. So, you know, if you need me to speak louder or, you know, not turn the lights off. I had a, a case where a student had a rare form of narcolepsy, and she would instantly hit REM sleep if it, the room became too dark. That was also the semester where the projector wasn't working very well, and the only way you could actually see the projector was to turn the lights off. She did not do well. She told me about this halfway through the semester, by the time it's pretty much too late. And, okay, I can make accommodations. I get a different projector. Uh, we had a spare in the department. I turned the lights on. 
and I would like to say she did well, but once you sleep through half the class, it's kind of too late. Uh, so you want to have this kind of thing there. Oh, by the way, the thing on color blindness. Um, for those of you who are familiar with chemistry, uh, phenolphthalein sits, the, the, the absorption from phenolphthalein sits right smack dab on the uh, frequency that the green cone um, absorbs at. So students with color blindness, uh, especially the red green one, cannot see the phenolphthalein and it's like flaming flamingo pink and they still can't see it. Um, so you have to switch to a different chemical. Uh, which is interesting. I've had several students with that case. Okay, next up, um, just kind of a generic uh, email me, please. Please be nice to each other. Once again, I'm setting the stage for if I need to discipline anyone for being a jerk online. I've had flame wars in the discussion boards. Pro tip, do not make discussion boards anonymous. Learn that the hard way. That was awkward. Anyways, um, so I'm setting the stage for is like if the person's asking like a jerk. Also, uh, that they need to use their email account from the school, which is just kind of a, a prof learning professionalism. Also, trying to avoid um, nefarious situations, you know, people pretending to be other people. Also, kind of putting in here, like, I have to know who you are kind of thing. I have had a lot of students that will go by different names and... I've had situations like I literally don't, I've got a paper in front of me and I literally do not know who gets this grade because the name on the paper does not match anything in my class. Um, so I'm giving myself the options, just saying, you know, you didn't put your name on the paper, you're getting a zero. Um, and just kind of letting them know. And just some disclaimers. Um, this is almost certainly not needed, but just <laughs> covering the posterior in case anything goes weird. Uh, and just kind of some advice. Once again, no one's ever going to read this, presumably. And then the last part. A lot of schools will have like, oh, you have to include this and this and this and this and this in your syllabus. Like, my syllabus is already four pages. I don't need it to be 27. No one reads it anyhow. So um, here's links to that. And here's my disclaimer of things are subject to change. Now, typically changes in syllabuses, if you're going to change them once class starts, uh, you have to get approval from a department chair or some kind of admin, etc. It's not... You better have a good reason for changing your syllabus, is basically the scenario. Okay, so let's look at that schedule. And I pulled up my 2019 schedule because 2020 was a mess. Okay, you'll notice that we are in uh, Microsoft Publisher. Uh, you can do this in Excel. Excel is not meant for this, though, and it does not work as well. You, people like to use Excel for a lot of things. It's not really meant for it. It's an insanely powerful spreadsheet program, but a lot of people use it for really what Publisher is used for. Uh, Publisher does cost a couple of bucks. Odds are, though, if you're working with uh, an institution, though, you'll probably have a site license for it anyhow. So I recommend using it, learning it. It's not that hard. If you're familiar with PowerPoint, uh, Publisher has a lot of the same feel of PowerPoint. And it really allows you to do a much nicer job, much easier job. Once you learn it, it is so much better. So this is in Publisher. And so I basically just made a grid. And so in this case, it's basically, okay, this is a Tuesday, Thursday class. Here's all the Tuesday th stuff. Here's all the Thursday stuff. And then I'm going to make all my assignments due Monday. Pro tip, always make your assignments due at 11.59. Um, if you want them due later in the, you know, like 4 a.m. or something, you make them due at 11.59 and you just tell everyone there's a grace period. Um, students will look at the date they are due. They will not look at the time that they are due. And they will assume it's 11.59. Partially it's because a lot of people put it at 11.59 and partially because the student just looks at the date. So assignments need to either be due when class starts slash stops um, or at 11.59 p.m. Do not put midnight. That will confuse everyone. And generally speaking, don't put any time earlier because they'll turn it in late. So, yeah. 11.59, add a grace period if you want it due in the morning. <laughs> Say it's due 11.59 to, you know, Monday night if you really want it due at 8 o'clock Tuesday morning. It's due 11.59 Monday night, and you have an 8-hour grace period. Uh, okay, so let's look at the schedule. So I've got the week. Most semesters are 16 weeks long or so. 
So I've got the date of the class. Sometimes I might put the date of the Monday. Sometimes I might put the date of the Sunday. Usually I don't do Sunday because, let's just be honest, Sunday really belongs to the week before it. <laughs> Monday's the start of the week. Um, for all practical purposes. So I either do the, you know, the Monday of the week or the class dates of the week. I'm leaning more towards the Monday of the week nowadays. I vary. And then I'll say, okay, we got series of units. Any more after 2019, starting 2020, I started calling all the units modules and then all these tests, I called them units. Formatting doesn't really matter. Just call them whatever you want. But I said, okay, here's everything that we're doing in you know, the unit one, here's unit two, I've labeled them. So now somebody who is from another school is looking over the validity of this class for them. It's like, okay, they covered measurement, atoms, nomenclature, molecules. Okay, this makes sense. This is a, you know, a standard whatever class. And so this tells the students what's going when. Some students will pay close attention to this, some won't. It, it happens. Uh, but this also gives you a lot of structure for yourself. You know what you're doing when, you know what you need to get done, and that really makes life a lot easier for you. So I strongly encourage you to lay this out in front. Teaching is a very front-loaded activity. You really want to be able to uh, get a lot of the work done in advance, and then the end is basically just grading. Um, so, yeah, uh, so this is kind of the beginning course material. And I've got this stuff up on my website, so you can download this, use this for whatever you would like. Uh, it's kind of a template. Uh, pro tip, if you are doing Publisher, though, most students don't have Publisher, so export it as a PDF. Uh, that way they can actually open it. Um, you don't really need to export the syllabus as a PDF. You can if you want. Uh, I mean, the students could download it, edit it, and then claim something. But once again, your department chair already has a copy at the start of the semester. So, you know, security-wise, that covers just about everything. And so, yeah. Uh, that's about it. Hopefully, you have a wonderful time setting up for your classes. And I will talk to you next time.